Well, we are in part four of this series, Reignite, and my hope, my encouragement for you personally is that this series can, well, be the kickstart you need for 2022, that, well, this can be a season of no matter what goes on around us, no matter how our year unfolds, that this can be your best year ever, that your faith can, well, reignite, or maybe for you, ignite for the very first time. We've been looking at these different, what we call faith catalysts. And what's important to note is that you won't find these exact phrases in the Bible, but you'll see the principles, the guiding truths everywhere. The first one we looked at was, well, act of learning. Jesus specifically said, for those who hear and put his words into practice, wisdom comes with that. It's not just about reading the Bible or hearing the Bible or knowing the Bible. It's about living it out. That leads to the second uh, faith callous and life-altering events. That the storms in our life, the trials in our lives, that no matter how bad, how intense those storms are, God can do something so incredible within us, through us. Well, all of that leads to a question that, well, I ended Uh, the message with last week. The question was, in the middle of a trial, what is the last thing you want to do? I I don't know how you answer that or maybe answering it right now, but maybe, just maybe, the last thing you want to do, I mean, I know for me, it's the last thing I want to do when the storms are raging. Maybe it's the same thing for you, or at least it's on the short list for you. Which leads, the answer leads to the third faith catalyst, and that's well, selfless serving. I know for me personally that when the storms of my life come crashing in, I, the last thing I want to do is think about other people's needs. When the storms are raging, the last thing I want to do is help someone else out. The last thing I want to do when my life is crumbling, when mentally I'm fried, emotionally I have nothing left in me, the last thing I want to do is try to help someone else. Is that the same for you? More than likely it is. You see, when the storms rage, we, well, we want to take our hands and hold on for dear life, don't we? But that's why we need to let go and let God. When the storms are raging, we take our eyes off of everyone else and we just start to go internal, don't we? When the storms are raging, well, we're just trying to make it through. In fact, maybe, just maybe, the greatest care for yourself is actually about caring for someone else. And we're going to see that, well, today. But remember, these five faith catalysts, they're not check boxes. It's not a hierarchy. It's not picking and choosing the ones you want, the ones you don't want. That All five of these are connected together. And as you Well, as you grow, as you stretch, as you lean into God, that all five of these start to intensify your faith. And maybe, just maybe, the one we're looking at today is the one that sets a fire within you. Well, we're going to be looking at one story today that will powerfully uh, descriptively uh, illustrates this, well, this faith cal- callus of selfless serving. We're going to be looking at uh, the story in, uh, it's found in Matthew chapter 14. And actually there's four different parts found in Matthew 14. The first part is what I've just titled a setup. And the setup actually is a setup for, well, these two parts with, well, they're both kids' stories. If you grew up in church, going to vacation, Bible school, Sunday school, kids' camp, you'll be very familiar with these two kids' stories. In fact, I still have in a storage box right now a craft from Vacation Bible School that gets tethered to, well, this kid's story right here. I still have it. It's moved uh, from house to house, from state to state. One day, my kids will get it. And I tell you, I think about it right now, and it makes me, well, it reminds me of this kid's story. Now, Tucked in between all of this is a, well, a not kid story. It's not a kid story at all. It's actually the story we're going to pay attention uh, to today. It's the story we're going to focus in on. But what's interesting is this not kid story always gets left out from these kid stories. I mean, they just do. So, hey, parents, parents, if you're parents and you have young kids, you know who you are. 
I, this is just a warning, but not just a warning. I just want to encourage you. You see, our adult services are crafted for really for teenagers, young adults, and on up. That's how we craft well, this experience that you're in right now. But you know we do that for kids? Our kids' rock environments are amazing. we got great team members that are passionate about making church fun, passionate about, well, teaching the Bible, kids' stories in the Bibles on a kid's level to help kids' faith, well, for them to reignite or ignite their faith. We have amazing kids' environments that are safe and secure. And I just want to encourage you, get your kids checked in. I mean, it'll be great for you as a parent, but it'll be great for them as well. And there's moments in our adult services that, well, we tell non-kid stories, and that's going to be today. Now, one other clarifying thought that's important as we get into this not-kid story. Remember, there's a setup and then ending with two kid stories, and we're not actually going to focus out much on the kid stories. You can read them, though. Found in Matthew 14. But this not kid story is actually a flashback. So there's going to be a setup, and then there's going to be a story that's, that's told that's flashing back into some period of time of history. Now, this isn't that long ago. We don't know exactly the timeline, but this isn't years before the setup of the kid story. It's not even months and months and months before. Maybe days, maybe a few weeks, maybe a month or Two, we're not really sure, but it's a really short period of time. But it is a flashback that will help tie this all in together. This will make sense here in a moment. So let's, we'll jump into this part of the story, and this is, well, the setup. And so Matthew tells us at that time, Herod the Tetrarch. Now, it's really important to understand who this Herod is. If you've ever read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you'll know there's a lot of Herods. And sometimes it's like, which one is it? You see, Herod the Great was, well, the king of the Jews, of Judea. Herod the Great is a famous king that gets tethered to, well, the Christmas story. And when Jesus was born, Herod the Great was in charge. Well, when Herod the Great died, he had a will. That will was given to Caesar. And in that will, the request was for Caesar of Rome to break his territory up into three different sections and give them to three of his sons, Herod Archelaus, Philip, and Herod Antipas. Now, this wasn't all of Herod's sons, but Herod Antipas is the son that, well, is going to be kind of the core part of the story today. So when Matthew writes Herod the Tetrarch, that's Herod Antipas. I'm going to leave it in yellow so you won't forget his name. Like I mentioned, this wasn't all of Herod the great sons. He had other sons. His oldest son was a, well, a guy named Antipater II. And in fact, Herod the Great had him killed. Yes, messy, dysfunctional family at its best. You see, Herod the Great found out that Antipater had a, a plot, a plan to poison him. So, well, Herod the Great just had him killed. Herod the Great had two other sons, Alexander I and Aristobulus, and those both, well, their mother was named uh, Miriam, and uh, Miriam was gorgeous, and Herod the Great was in love with Miriam, but Herod the Great was fearful of any other dynasty that might raise up and remove him from power, and Miriam was a Hasmonean princess, so Herod the Great had her killed, which kind of upset the boys, and eventually Herod the Great had his two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, killed as well. Then there's another son, and his name's Herod II, also known as Philip. And that Herod, well, he didn't get into the will. Why didn't he get in the will? Because Herod the Great found out that Herod II, Philip, also knew about the plot to poison him. And so he wasn't in the will. Herod the Great probably was going to have him killed, but Herod the Great died. So Herod II just moved into Jerusalem and lived a normal life. He didn't get any power, any territory, any wealth that came with it, but he was alive. So in the will, the land was broken up in this way. Herod Archelaus was given Judea, Samaria, and uh, Adumea, also known as Edom, which gets tethered back to Esau. But the most important part of the land was Judea, because this is where Jerusalem was. Pretty sh shortly after Herod Archelaus was in power, Caesar didn't like what he was doing, removed him, made this entire region a province of Rome, and put someone in charge. In fact, you go just a few years and... Well, Pontius Pilate, the governor, was in charge. 
Philip was given a, a region called Batania. It was the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, and this will be part of the story to this day, and, or today. And then Herod Antipas was given Perea, which was a strip of land kind of south of the Sea of Galilee, touching the Dead Sea and, well, most famously, Galilee, where Jesus spent most of his kind of time in his public ministry right along the shores of Galilee. And, well, so when Matthew writes, well, Herod the Tetrarch, it was Herod Antipas, and well, Herod Antipas, well, he hears the reports about Jesus, and then he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. So implied there is John the ba Baptist is dead, but he hears these reports about this, this person doing, well, amazing mir uh, miracles with amazing powers, and he's like, it has to be John the Baptist. Remember, this is a setup, okay? This is a setup. Now we get into the flashback. So Herod Antipas thinks that John the Baptist is back from the dead because he's hearing reports about this person with all of these miraculous powers. And then we step into the flashback. The flashback, well, now Herod had arrested John the Baptist and bound him and put him in prison. Why? And this is where <laughs> the, the salacious and scandalous story comes to life because of Herodias. And who is Herodias, you ask? Well, Matthew gives us a glimpse. His brother Philip's wife. Now, we have to go down this rabbit trail because you have to understand the intensity, both politically and personally, of what's going on within this family that will impact John the Baptist and, oh, by the way, impacts Jesus himself. See, we go back and we look at this, well, the, the chart of sons that Herod the Great, and the three we really need to focus in on are Herod Antipas, Aristobulus, and Herod II, because these three sons, well, this is where the story gets tethered to. We're told by Matthew about, well, this, this lady, this woman named Herodias, and what we know is Herodias was the daughter of Aristobulus IV, but Herodias marries her uncle, Herod II, Philip, right? So this is husband and uncle. I'm just telling you, you thought your family was messy? This one is going to get messier. Well, during the same time period, Herod Antipas was married to a Nabataean princess. We're not sure her name, but her father was King Artis of the Nabataean Empire. If you're I'm not familiar with the Nabataeans. It was a region kind of where modern-day Jordan is now, and what they're famous for is Petra. Been there. It's amazing stone uh, carvings and temples in the side of these mountains that's actually in these ravines. It's amazing. So Herod Antipas is married to this Naz, uh, has, uh, Nabataean princess, and well, along the way, Herod Antipas falls in love with Herodias. Herod Antipas' wife gets wind of this love affair and she runs off to dad to tell dad what was going on. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're a king or just a regular old dad. If your daughter comes home and tells you this story, right, dads? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your anger meter is now redlined. So she tells them, and Herod Antipas and, well, the Nabataeans go to war. And guess what? Herod Antipas loses. But he can't lose. Why? Because he's a vassal for Rome. But he loses this war. So he has to crawl back to Rome to let Rome, hey, I lost a the war. They're going to take the land. So what does Rome do? Rome sends in their troops to push out the Nabataeans. So this is bad personally for uh, Herod Antipas. And it's bad politically. Because what Herod Antipas knows is Rome will just remove him from power. Like his brother, Herod Archelaus. So this thing is a complete mess. And can you feel the intensity? Again, personally, politically. Well, through all of this, Herod Antipas marries Herodias. Marries her. Now, there's one other person that I'm going to introduce now because she comes into the story here in just a few moments. So I just want to connect the doubts. There's someone else named Salome. Salome is the daughter of Herodias and Herod II. Just remember that because, again, the story gets messier by 
the moment. So when Matthew writes for us, hey, by the way, his brother Philip's wife, you understand this wasn't just a huh, this was a mess, including war and you know, Rome involved and all of that. And then, well, John the Baptist, well, he's kind of stirring the pot a bit. And well, he's been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have her. It's not lawful. In fact, you can read Leviticus 18 and Leviticus chapter 21, and the, the line is, it's abhorrent for you to marry your brother's wife. Now, I don't think we need that written down, <laughs> but it was written down, and John the Baptist was like, hey, Herod, you can't do that. It's your brother's wife. You can't marry her. That, that's against Jewish law. What are you doing? But every time John the Baptist brings this up, remember, it's not just a personal tension and friction. They went to war because of this. And Herod Antipas wants to keep his power. And part of him keeping his power is keeping all the people happy because if the people aren't happy, Rome's going to come in and remove him from power. I mean, this is a complex, complicated, intense situation. So much so that Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of people because they considered John a prophet, not just any old prophet. Remember, they considered John the Baptist and the, the, the spirit and the power of Elijah, the most famous of all the Jewish prophets. And on Herod's birthday, uh, the Jewish people during that time, they didn't celebrate birthdays, but this was a very Hellenistic kind of cultural piece. And so they're celebrating the birthday. And on his birthday, we're told that the daughter, Salome of Herodias and Herod II, danced for the guests. Now, this didn't happen. Salome would have been considered a princess, and princess wouldn't just dance for the dinner guests. Now, they would have hired people to dance for the guests, but a princess wouldn't have. So this is way outside the norm. So she's dancing, and we're told that it pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. I mean, this is a blank check. So what does Salome do? She goes to her mom, Herodias, and Herodias kind of whispers in her ear, and Salome comes back to Herod, her stepdad and uncle. Again, messy, and goes, this is what I want. Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Now, Herod was in a tough spot. He didn't know what to do. Remember, like he couldn't infuriate the people because he didn't want to lose his position. But now in front of all of his guests, he's given an oath. And that's what Matthew tells us. He goes, hey, he was distressed. He, he didn't know what to do because of his oath and his dinner guests. He had to do something. So he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in prison. Now, before I read what Matthew writes next, I just want to encourage you, just put yourself in, into this position for a moment. Just, just step into this. The birthday party is going. People are laughing and eating and drinking. I mean, this is a, a feast upon feast. Salome is dancing. Herod grants the request. I mean, it had to be a hush. He has to follow through with the request. And then we're told that John the Baptist's head was brought in into the party on a platter and given to Salome. I mean, his head had just been cut off. I mean, this is as gruesome as we can imagine. And she carries the head on a platter to her mom, Herodias, and hands it to her. I can't personally comprehend a scene like this. It doesn't get more intense than that. We're told that John's disciples came in, took his body, and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Now we have to realize the relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist. I mean, what Jesus fully realized was John the Baptist was the promised forerunner. I mean, Jesus knew that. He was the one that God had planned 
to move in first, to tell all people that the Messiah, the promised one, is coming. I mean, for Jesus, John the Baptist was a partner in ministry, a partner in leadership. He realized they had two very distinct roles, but they were working together for what God was putting into motion. And oh, by the way, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. If you've been baptized before, you know like that moment you don't forget. And who baptized you? You see that person, you see that water, you see that moment. You just, you, right? It's one of those moments that gets captured into your mind. And beyond all of that, Jesus and John the Baptist were family. They're family. Jesus' mom Mary and John's mom Elizabeth were what the Bible calls cousins or relatives. And this was someone close to him. And we're told that when Jesus heard. Now this is coming out of the flashback. So this actually gets tethered back into verse 1 and 2. When Herod the Great said, John the Baptist is alive. I mean, there's a guy out there with all of this miraculous power and I guess he's alive. I mean, so so get what's going on here. We start off with a setup where Herod the Antipas thinks that John the Baptist, the one who he had beheaded, whose head was carried in on a platter, got handed to his, well, his daughter Salome, who handed it to Herodias. I mean, he saw it all, but he's hearing reports thinking Jesus is alive. That was the setup. So when Matthew writes, when Jesus heard, it goes back to that moment where, well, here in Antipas, thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist, who's now alive. He goes, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And we got to ask the question, why? The question why is really important. That's why we have to understand the flashback and the political intensity of what's going on. There's two reasons why. One is this. There's a pacing going on. And you see this with Jesus all the time. Jesus knew that he was going to die. Jesus knew he was going to give his life. But he was waiting for the right time. You see, when Jesus withdrew here, he went to the other side of the lake. Most scholars feel like he went to an area where this little town called Bethsaida is. And you know where that's located? Right outside of Herod Antipas' territory. It was actually into Philip, the Tetrarch's territory. So he would have left Herod Antipas' rule, reign, authority. You see, Jesus was pacing it because he realized If Herod Antipas really thought that John the Baptist was alive, he would send all of his armies after him. And it wasn't his time to go. But I think there's another reason why he withdrew. I think Jesus just needed a pause. I think he personally needed a pause. I mean, again, close relationship with John the Baptist. Family relationship, ministry relationship. I mean, God-ordained relationship. Like, there's a lot there. But I also think for the disciples, they, they needed to get away. It was a lot for them. The disciples knew that if Herod Antipas came after Jesus, they were all attached to Jesus. You see, there was a lot of emotions going. There's a storm raging. And so Jesus was like, hey, let's just, let's just well, we gotta, we got to pace some things, but we also just need to take a breath. We also just need to get away and just, <sighs> So they got away to the other side of the lake and were told that when they got on the other side of the lake, the crowds, the crowds, we know they're somewhere around 15 to 20,000 people, crowds, massive crowds, followed him on foot from the towns. And Matthew tells us that when Jesus saw, saw the large crowds, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Jesus withdrew then he saw them and had compassion. As evening approached, this gets into that first kid story. The disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, hey, Jesus, send, send them away. Just send them away. We're tired. We don't have food. It's been a long day. A lot of emotions. We're kind of running for our lives. Kind of in self preservation mode, not sure what Herod Antipas is going to do. Hey, Jesus, let's let's just call it a day. We can figure things out tomorrow. And Jesus looks at the disciples and said, they do not need to go. You give them something 
to eat. You see, this is the picture of selfless serving. Jesus is like, hey, you give them something to eat. I know it's been a difficult day. I know we're also grieving from John's brutal death. We know there's uncertainty because we have no idea what Herod Antipas is planning. We know that 20 some thousand people need something from us and we have nothing to give. I understand all of that, but right now we have an opportunity to give of ourselves and give to these people. And you know what happens? Out of one small boy's lunch, they feed everyone. It wasn't based off of their strength. It wasn't based off of their provision. It wasn't based off of anything they did, but God showed up and showed off. You see, that is a picture of selfless serving. And over and over again, Jesus modeled what it looked like to no matter what the storm was raging around, that you still give of yourself. Hey, Christ followers, you gotta lean into this. Christ followers, if you've named Jesus the subject of your life, do you know what your call is from God? It's to empty your cup depending on God to fill you back up. Do you realize that? As a Christ follower, that's selfless serving. Do you realize as Christ followers that, that when you walk into a church for a service, it's not so much for you. I mean, there is components for you and for me. But when you walk in, you should be saying, hey God, how do you want to use me right now? God, I want to empty my cup. Maybe when you go find a seat in a row, you just look around you and you find someone you don't know and you just have a conversation. Maybe it's someone you don't know, you haven't talked to, or someone that you know is going through something and you walk up and say, I just want to pray with you. Hey, Christ followers, did you realize? Yeah, there's a component to a church service that's for you. But greater than that, you should be walking and saying, I'm going to empty my cup. If you've ever left a church service and it's like, I didn't get anything out of it. Is that you? To be honest, you didn't get anything out of it because God wanted you to empty your cup. You missed the person that God was intersecting their life with you. and God was saying, just empty yourself. That maybe the, the song list isn't for you. Maybe the message isn't for you. Maybe you standing at a door just smiling and greeting and welcoming people is about emptying your cup. Maybe it's taking a step into one of our kids' rock environments. Say, I'm just gonna make church the, the best hour of a kid's week. I can do that. I can have fun. I can smile. Maybe for you, it's sitting next to someone and praying with them. And maybe they don't even know you're praying with them. Do you just, just realize that just maybe, just maybe, church is about so much more than you just getting but it's about you emptying. But it just doesn't happen in a church service. That's why we say all the time, see a need, meet a need. See a need, meet a need. See a need, see a need meet a need. That's selfless serving as Christ followers. And it doesn't matter what the storm looked like around you. Last week, I shared three questions that I just want to encourage you to ask God. Three questions were, how is God shaping me? How is God strengthening me? And how is God sustaining me? This week at our staff meeting, we just took some time, and I put those three questions up on the screen, and I just asked all of our team to get out their notebook and, well, again, active learning. And we just walked through each one of these questions and gave time for people just to be quiet, to listen, to write. That's what I did. I sat down, I started to write. And when I got to how is God strengthening me, I was also thinking about the third question, how was God sustaining me? And I was also thinking about how God was shaping me. And I, I wrote one word down. I wrote the word resolve down. Resolve. Hey, God, it's been a difficult season, and I, I don't know if I want to, but the resolve to say God has just called us as Christ followers to show up. I've said this to staff so many times. Hey, I, I know it's been difficult, but let's just keep showing up for people. Let's just keep showing up, trusting that God 
will fill the gap. And so I wrote the word resolve down, and then there's a psalm that came to my mind, and I couldn't quite remember where in the psalms it was, so I, I Googled it, just being honest. I Googled it, and this was the psalm, Psalm chapter 73, verse 26, and I wrote it down. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You see, that selfless serving, when we give all of ourselves, when we empty our cup, trusting, depending that God will be our portion, he will be enough. He will sustain. He will strengthen. He will fill us back up. God just wants us to empty ourselves. Hey, Christ followers, this is for you. Don't wait until you have enough. That's not selfless serving. Selfless serving is saying, God, I don't, but you, you do. God, I'm not, but you are. God, I don't know what to give because this year, this month, this season has wiped it out of me. But God, I'm going to have a position of faith to serve selflessly. I, I'm going to look for ways to empty my cup. And maybe my cup is empty, but I'm trusting that you will fill my cup as I empty myself in others. I just want to encourage you. Live a life of selfless serving and watch what God does in you and through you. We have so many incredible ways to serve here. You know, and that church is just one way to serve. It's not the only way. But we want to help partner with you to help you serve. Walk up to your campus, Pastor, and just say, I want to serve. I just want to serve. Put me somewhere. I just want to empty, I just want to empty myself. Maybe that's the prayer right now. You're saying, okay, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start looking for needs. And God, I just want to empty myself and I'm depending, I'm trusting that you will fill my cup. You see, maybe, maybe what you're going through is not just for you. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we're just open, <laughs> that we're your vessels. Lord, I, I pray specifically for people. No matter the intensity of the storm around them, that they'll just see that the faith journey is about emptying ourselves, depending that you are going to fill us up. That that is the catalyst. And when we don't have it in us, you are our portion. When emotionally we don't have it, you are our portion. When mentally we're fried, you are our portion. When we have nothing left to give, that you are our portion. So we'll set a fire. Set a fire that we can't contain, that we can't control. In your name I pray. Amen.